Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. I'm going to reverse it a little bit. I'm going to pray first and then welcome everybody. Lord Jesus, you are the bread of life. Let us feast on you today and find nourishment for our souls. You are the light of the world. Let us follow you out of the darkness and into the light. You are the door. Let us enter your presence through you, Jesus, in your name. You are the good shepherd. Let us rest in your provision and under your guidance. And as you guard us, may we know peace. You are the resurrection and the life. Let us find true life and victory in you and in you alone. You, Jesus, are the way, the truth, and the life. Let us love you with all our heart, all our soul, all our mind, indeed, all our strength, while we live and breathe and have our being. Let you be our, may you be our sufficiency in this world and in the next. In your holy name we pray, and all God's people said, amen. amen. Thank you very much. Well, welcome to First Baptist Church, Sun Lakes. It's good to see you today. We have some visitors today. I want you to know that you are visiting with us. You are our honored guests, and we are very thankful that you're here with us. And I hope that this will give you a little taste of the believers here. We are like a Bible church. It's just that we're Southern Baptists. We, we hold the Bible up high. We, we pay for our missionaries through the cooperative program. And we govern through poli our polity as, as a body. And, and uh, that's the only difference between us and a Bible church. And so we are glad you're here today that we might be in his word and that his word would do its perfect work in us because his word will never return empty. It will last forever. Though heaven and earth will pass away, his word lasts forever. This week, we want you to know that tomorrow the office is closed. Now, we pulled a fast one on you Friday. Yes, we did. We, we did close the office on Friday. Diane worked so hard to get the uh, newsletter out and, and everything else that we went ahead and closed the office on Friday. And, uh, and she deserved a good day to, to get off. And then Tuesday, uh, this coming Tuesday, the Band of Brothers will meet. The Women's Connection event will meet at 9.30. The Band of Brothers is at 9. Don't forget to sign up for the best Bible study ever on Lamentations. Some of you aren't coming to that Bible study, and you need to be here. If you don't know anything about Lamentations, this is the study for you. It is a study that you've probably never had before. Not many preachers teach on Lamentations. But you need to hear it. It's a wonderful story. It is a story that applies to us in this day, in our time. And also there is a dinner that we have beforehand at 5 o'clock. And you need to sign up for that. So please go after the service. Make sure you sign up either in the foyer or out here and, uh, or, or even in the CLC. We have sign-ups at each location and sign your name there. It, it, by the way, that, that supper is by donation only. And then uh, Thursday, we have churchwide prayer in the CLC. The, the, the rails of the Holy Spirit run, the, locomotive, uh, the locomotion of the Holy Spirit run on the rails set down by those who pray. And so we hope that you'll be here for prayer on Thursday morning at 9 o'clock. And then next Sunday, this, today's the last day to, to sign up for Grandparents Day. Now, Grandparents Day is next Sunday. Do I have that right? Thank you. Next Sunday, and after church, we're having a dinner, and it's $8 a person. Now, many of you here, your, grandparents, your grandchildren are grown. That's okay. Bring them anyway. And ask them to bring their children so you have great-grandchildren. So we'll have great-grandparents day, too. All right? And if you're great-great, we'll have great-great-grandparents day. All right? Now then, uh, we have some committee meetings coming up, but don't forget, please sign up that there is a barbecue and concert on Wednesday the 13th, starting at 4 p.m. 4 p.m. will be a concert, a gospel concert, provided by the world-famous Jones Brothers Quartet. Hey, hey. Now, you please invite your neighbors. If, if you don't at least invite one neighbor, uh, then, you know, we're not, we need to pack this thing out. 
And so please invite your neighbors. So uh, don't, don't let a day go by without inviting a neighbor to the Jones Brothers Gospel Con- uh, Quartet concert on the 13th, followed by a barbecue dinner. Now the dinner is $8 a piece, which is actually, uh, actually just a great bargain. I can't go to Rudy's or some other place for $8. So this is fantastic, right? Yeah. Part. Oh, no cost. I'm sorry. I thought it was eight dollars per. So I, I, my bad. So it's free. It's free. That well, the, everybody just perked up. <laughs> Did the pastor just say free? So so come one, come all. Okay, and 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 uh, but please sign up so we know how many to expect. Okay. All right. Having said that, it's so good to see you today. It's so good to be here uh, this Lord's Day. If you're watching us from the internet, we want to welcome you today. I don't, we don't have time today to go through any names, but we just want you to know we love you. We're glad that you're here today. We're glad that you are a part of us. Even though we don't see you, you're still here. You're part of us here today. God bless you all. Gene? Shall we stand and sing, I sing the mighty power of God, number 48 in your hymnals, or I believe it'll be on the screen. I sing the mighty I'm okay. Sorry. All right. Faith is a victory, number 521. Or it'll be on the screen. If you want to sing harmony, it's 521. In hand around the hill.
to read with me some Old Testament scriptures. Let's see if I, if I can find them. <laughs> it should be on the screen. There we go. One day after Moses had grown up, he went out to where his own people were and washed them at their hard labor. He saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his own people, glancing this way and that, and seeing no one, he killed the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. Isn't that just like us? We're always trying to fix things ourselves. Go ahead. Okay, let's stand and sing, Jesus, Jesus, Lord to me, just before we go to prayer. It's number 300 in your hymnals if you want to sing harmony. This morning we pray for the victims of uh, the hurricane that hit Florida and Georgia and the Carolinas. Lord, we know that many people lost their homes and, and uh, many other things, and we just pray for them, Father. And for those that go there to help them, uh, to bring food and water and, and things like that. And we pray also for Eric and Donnie Naylor, church planters in Lahana, Maui, uh, who lost everything, their church, their school, everything, and, and the fire there in Maui. And so we pray for them. Pray for missionaries everywhere that they have laid everything on the line. We pray for our church members uh, and those on the prayer list. Lord, I especially pray for uh, Laverne Saylor this morning, who's not here because she's having heart problems. Lord, we just pray that you'll touch her and uh, make her well. We pray for the homeless, for those on drugs and alcohol, for those without jobs, we pray for the immigrants living on the street. We pray for the greedy, for those who seek power and for those who are in power. Help us to see the darkness of sin that encompasses our country and, and help us to repent before it's too late. Help us to be faithful witnesses, Lord, to be fervent in spirit and to serve you with gladness so that the lost world might want to know Jesus as our Savior. The hours come for us to wake from sleep. The night's far gone. The day is at hand. Our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. Let us put on the armor of light and share Jesus with the lost world. 
Finally, thank you, Lord, for your mercy and your grace. And bless this family of faith called First Baptist Church of Sun Lakes. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. God works in mysterious ways, and we are so grateful today to um, 
see that he has answered prayer in a number of ways. That um, Laverne Zaylor actually did was able to show up today, and and we have also George and Joan Shuttleworth back here. George, it's great to have you back. And Joan, great to have you here. Blessings to you. We've been looking forward to seeing your faces. And so glad you're able to make it today. He answered the prayer in Yuri's life right behind you, George. Yuri, uh, he's, he and his wife are here today. We're glad to see you. And he's answered prayer in uh, the life of so many people. And uh, we are very thankful. That's why prayer is so important. So I hope you will join us for prayers and prayer on Thursday. We're in a sermon series called The Story of Faith, and today is, is part 13. I'm actually, it's, it's really neat the way God worked this out because I didn't have to go out of the sermon series to, for the Lord's Supper. Today's a perfect passage for the Lord's Supper. You see, faith, according to the writers of Hebrews, is given by God. It, it is a deposit that God puts into our hearts. Peter talks about it in 1 Peter chapter 1, that it is a deposit he places into our hearts. And not only, and that deposit is held in two places, one in our heart, two in heaven. So it's kind of like a lockbox in heaven, and your, one in your heart's the key. Jesus said, I am the door. No man, no man gets through that door except through him, right? He's the door. So he puts that key in our heart. That key is faith. Faith unlocks that door of salvation that is preserved for you, for those of you who are the elect of Jesus Christ. There is a significant point in your life where you ask Jesus to come in, into your life, that you proclaim him as Lord of your life that you understand that your sin separated you from God, that you, that you turn your back on sin and you walk toward the light, away from the darkness. We can't manufacture faith. We can't fake faith. It's impossible to please God except through faith. In Abel, we saw faith worshiping. In Enoch, we found him walking. In Noah, we found faith working. In Abraham and the patriarchs, we found faith waiting. These patriarchs often did not understand how, why, when, or where God worked. The writers of Hebrews described how, by faith, Moses realized he was a Hebrew. And he refused to be known as the son of the Pharaoh's daughter, choosing instead to be mistreated along with his kinsmen. Moses was a type of of Christ. Let me read the passage for you in Hebrews chapter 11, verses 24 through 28. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to be mistreated along with the people of God rather than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a short time. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt because he was looking ahead to his reward. Are you looking ahead to your reward? By faith he left Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. He persevered because he saw him who is invisible. By faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood so that the destroyer of the firstborn would not touch the firstborn of Israel. Father, we thank you for your word. May it increase so many fold in our hearts today. Do a work in my heart. Do a work in the hearts of those here. By the power of your word. In Jesus' name. Amen. We hold in our hands this precious word of God. I do hope that you bring it to church with you. You see, church is not just something you add to your life and you attend. And it's not a club. It's not a clubhouse. It's not 
something that you just casually come into. We are coming into what the angels of heaven lean and peer over into the earth and are in wonder about. They're like, whoa, these people are gathered together under the name of Jesus Christ, under the banner of his love. And they are, they're just amazed that we come together to worship the Lord. They're amazed that we come together to ascribe glory and strength to his name. It doesn't really matter what songs you use, whether they're the old traditional hymns or whether they're the new choruses. It doesn't matter. They're amazed that, that we come before his presence with singing and into his course with praise. They're amazed that we come before him and pray and lift up our petitions to him. They're amazed that we open this timeless, timeless word and read it and seek to understand it. This does you no good closed. It only does you good if you are taking it and opening it and applying it to your heart and your mind and your life. Listen, I've got three fingers pointing back at me, so it that's, that's three times more it applies to me that much. This word is only good if you take it and let it come into your heart and mind. That's why that verse, love the Lord with all your heart, how can you love him with all your heart if you're not taking his word into your heart? Love the Lord with all your heart, all your mind. How can you love the Lord if you're not taking his word into your mind? Love the Lord with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul. How can you love the Lord with all your soul if he's not transforming your soul through the word? And all your might. I hold in my hands the key to kingdom living. It's my manual for a meaningful life. It's my handbook for holiness, my guide to godliness. Within its pages are my directions for doing God's will. By God's power, he will use his word, prayer, his people, and his spirit to transform me into the incorruptible image of his son, Jesus Christ. That's the goal of God. God's goal is to transform us to the image of his son. His goal for us is to reach all the world the Great Commission. We are to be telling other people about it. I have a feeling that Moses' mother, when she was nursing him, was telling Moses about it. She nursed him until he was weaned. We don't know what age he was weaned at. It might have been as old as three or four years old. A four-year-old child can remember things. I remember things when I was four. I had a little red wagon. And my older brother, who's three years older, would, 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 he would hold the handle and he would carry, you know, pull me along the sidewalk. We were Air Force brats. We lived on an Air Force base. My father was, a, was an officer. And, and so my brother, who, who was always tall for his age, he would put, I would get in this wagon and he'd pull me along the sidewalks of the Air Force base and the, the Air Force housing. We just thought that was something else, that little red wagon. And Phil never seemed to comp complain about pulling me. He always liked to be in control. <laughs> now, if you're watching me, Philip, you know it's true. So, we had a delightful time. But I have a feeling that Moses' mother while she was nursing her son, and while she was caring for him during those, those months and years that Pharaoh's daughter, the princess of Egypt, was paying <laughs> Moses' own mother to take care of him. It's just a wonderful story. She was able to love that child. She was able to inculcate faith into that child. She was able to tell, she was probably even able to recite the Shema to him. She was probably even able to, to recite prayers and to, to tell him of the Lord, the one and only. And at some point, as, after she gave him back to the princess, I know it's not in Scripture. This is total conjecture on your pastor's part. I can't imagine the princess, the princess of Egypt she had enough love to let the child live. She had enough love to let the child be nursed. I'm, 
I suspect she even may have suspected the child's mother winged him. And that's just a suspect. It's not in his word. But I suspect also that if she had that much love to let the Hebrew child live, she more than likely had enough love to let that child continue some type of relationship with the woman who nursed him. He somehow had an identity that was transferred to to him at an early age. I'll tell you why I believe that. Moses takes up a great deal of the record of Exodus, the entire record of Exodus. And you don't form an identity later in life. The most critical years of identity are formed from birth to right before, you know, around nine or ten years old. And children who are unable to form an identity in those years usually suffer greatly. Those are the children that evil men seek to capture and sell into human trafficking so that they don't have time to form an identity. They don't have time to form memories. They don't have time. They, they, they haven't had that, that ingraining into their hearts. So Moses grew up. And it said in the scripture that we read that he refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Why? Because the story reads that he, in Exodus chapter 2, that he saw a Hebrew being beaten by one of the Egyptian soldiers or slave masters, and he killed him. Moses committed murder in the first degree. It was a crime of passion. He even hid it. He hid it thinking that he was safe from any type of prosecution. Well, it wasn't long afterward that he saw two Hebrew men arguing and fighting and they were fighting so severely and so harshly that Moses tried to intervene he said why are you talking so so harshly to your brother can't you resolve your dispute and so the guy who was at fault says oh are you going to kill are you going to kill me just like you did the Egyptian uh oh the news has been out Somebody let the cat out of the bag. Moses all of a sudden realized that what he tried to cover up, God had uncovered. And so Moses did what any guilty person would do that has been found out. He ran. He tried to to run. He ran as far as he could. He ran into the desert. It's a great story. He ends up fending off a bunch of shepherds who were accosting some women, the daughters of a, of, a, of, of a rather wealthy shepherd. And he, fend, he, he protects these women, and they go back and tell their father that this Egyptian, they thought Moses was an Egyptian, said this Egyptian protected us, and, and he... he, he threw off our attackers. And so the, their father said, well, go get him. Tell him to come in here. We got a supper for him. Moses ended up marrying his oldest daughter, Zipporah. It's a great story. If you've never read it, you've got to read it. What do we learn from this scripture in Hebrews, though, and from the life of Moses? Number one, we learn that Moses was a type of Christ because he heard his father's voice. He heard his father's voice. You see, God speaks first. We might go to God and we might might beg him. We might say, God, just speak to me, please. Just speak to me. I need to hear your voice. And you might hear nothing. You might hear silence. God speaks when he wants to speak. 
And he always waits for the perfect moment to speak. And when he spoke to Moses, it was out of a burning bush. Moses was a curious guy, very intelligent. He was raised, you got to understand, in the courts of Pharaoh, so he had the highest education possible at that day. He had the very highest possible opportunities to learn. He probably knew at least four languages. He knew mathematics. He knew sciences of, that was available to him at that day. And he was curious. He said, here's this, here's this bush. I mean, just imagine a tumbleweed in the desert. And let's say it's, 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 it's hit up against a rock. And it hit up against a rock, and, it, and somehow or other, this tumbleweed just starts burning, and it doesn't burn up. Because you know how quick tumble, tumbleweeds can burn up. How many of you ever burned a tumble, tumbleweed? Nobody? Just a few. Okay, a few of us. You know that when you put them in a fire, they go like this. And that's pretty much it. But Moses is in the desert, and he sees this, this burning bush, and he's going, whoa. It, this thing's not burning up. It just continues to burn. It's a flame. And he gets closer to it and closer. He goes, whoa, this, I've never seen anything like this. How could it, what's keeping it burning? How can this happen? And all of a sudden, he hears this voice, Moses. And he must have hit himself on the head like, he must have gone, what is going on? Am I hearing things? And he's getting closer, and he is Moses. Take the sandals off of your feet, for the place that you are standing is on holy ground. And Moses complies. God spoke first, and Moses understood. Now, there's a lot about that conversation that Moses argued with God about. You see, we're all, like I've told you before, we are all Israelites. The name Israel means to wrestle with God. And we're all Israelites. You're an Israelite and I'm an Israelite. I wrestle with God all the time. Well, Moses kind of wrestled with God in an argument in the desert. God told him he wanted to go deliver the Israelites, and Moses said, oh, no, I mean, you know, I, I'm just really amazed that this bush is burning and it's not being consumed, but, and I know you're God talking to me, but can't you get somebody that's a little better at speaking? I'm, I can't speak. And Moses says, well, what about your brother? He's, he's very eloquent. He'll speak for you. And Moses says, well, I just don't have, I just don't have the capacity to lead. You know, I, come, I, you know he's, and, and God, he, God gives him an application for every excuse he had. For his weakness in leading, he said, take that staff. This staff will be your proof that you're the leader. Throw the staff on the ground. And all kinds of things happened with that staff. God was inculcating into Moses that he had the power to do it. Why? Because God was with him. God was giving him the power. Moses didn't have it naturally. It was going to be a God-given gift. And the staff represented that God-given gift. Moses heard the Father's voice. God spoke first. God's voice always speaks truth. God speaks, God's voice always speaks authoritatively. God's voice always speaks with omniscience because he had a purpose and a plan for his life. When was the last time you heard God's voice speak to you? As a type of Christ, Moses left his mother and home. Not only did Moses hear the father's voice, but secondly, he left his mother and home, just as Jesus did. Jesus was, it was actually at a point in his ministry when his mother and brothers came and, and they, weren't still, they, were, they were still trying to come to grips with the understanding that Jesus was the Christ, the Yeshua HaMashiach. He was the promised one. He was the one with all authority from heaven and earth. He was the one who would redeem 
the sins of people, the sins of all mankind. They were still trying to get a grips with it. They thought he'd gone mad, perhaps. They came, they, they tried to get him out of wherever he was, and he said, they said, your, your mother and your brothers are here to take you home. And you know what Jesus' answer was to them? You are my mothers and my brothers. I don't think we really grasp the importance of that one statement. We are so tied to the world, to our earth, that we can't imagine forsaking one's own mother. But Jesus told his followers, anyone who would follow me, let them take up their cross and follow me. Forsaking all others. How highly do you prize Christ? How highly do you hold him in your heart? Is it high enough to forsake your mother and your father? By forsake, I'm not saying, Jesus actually says, it'll be as if, you're, as if it, to the world it'll seem like hate, but it's not. It's, it's following Christ with total, total abandonment. Oswald Chambers called it total abandonment. In other words, you're total abandoned to in, everything, you abandon everything else on this earth to follow Christ and Christ alone. We see that he was a type of Christ because he heard the Father's voice. Secondly, he was a type of Christ because he's left his mother and home. Even though he had come to realize that he was a Hebrew, Moses left his mother, his, his earthly adopted mother, the princess, and his home. Thirdly, as a type of Christ, Moses suffered for his people. He suffered for his people because he was motivated for the joy of freedom and the joy of a homeland. Look at this in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 20, 20, uh, 26. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt because he was looking ahead to his reward. Are you looking ahead to your reward? The, see, the thing about it is, Christian, is that a lot of times we think, oh, I've punched the ticket, I got my ticket to heaven, I'm looking for my reward. But the half-brother of Jesus said, oh, you want to check yourself at the door here, because I tell you that faith without works is dead. You think you got the ticket, but you're not willing to make the sacrifice. You think you got the ticket to get into heaven, but you're not willing to tell others about Jesus. You think you got the ticket to heaven, but you're not willing to lay it all down at the foot of the cross. It requires your whole heart, your whole mind, everything that you are. Knowing you, Jesus, knowing you, there is no greater thing. You're my all, you're the best. You're my joy, my righteousness. And I love you, Lord. Moses was a type of Christ because he heard the Father's voice. He was a type of Christ because he left his mother and home. He was a type of Christ because he partnered with God by suffering for his people, because he was looking for a homeland. Before these verses even came up in Hebrews, the writers of Hebrews in verses 13 and 14 said this, all these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance. And they admitted that they were aliens and strangers on earth. People who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. 
As it turns out, Moses was only able to see the promised land from a distance. He was not allowed to go into it. The biblical precept is this. Moses was a type of Christ because the the grief of hardship that he bore was that which brought freedom to the captives. When Jesus made his first reading of Scripture in the temple, he said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. And in that reading from Isaiah, he said, Because I have come to release the captives. In Philippians chapter 2, we see how real this really is. Paul wrote to the church in Philippi about Jesus and how we should have the same attitude. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ, Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, Being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place, gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee would bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So how does this apply to us today? Well, the first application is pretty obvious because it's right in front of you. That we identify with Christ through his suffering and death as that which was the propitiation, the one who redeemed us, the one who paid the price for our sins. Because it was our sin that separated us from God, and Christ redeemed us. He put us back in right relationship with God. When we give our heart, when we give our heart to him, when we confess him as Lord and Savior, Jesus said that his sheep would know his voice and follow him in living. So one of the first things that this can apply to us is that just as Moses heard God's voice and understood it, we need to hear Jesus' voice and understand it. Number two, do not harden your heart to God's voice. Moses tried to harden his heart if you if you read the argument that he had with God he tried to give excuses not to be the one chosen but God overruled number three discover who you are discover who you are just as Moses discovered his own identity then you discover who are you who are you in God's eyes How did God form you? Fourthly, partner with God in a mission and purpose for your life. If you're not partnering with God for a mission and purpose in your life, how can you truly say that you're following him? Because Jesus said, go ye into all the world, teaching them whatever things I have commanded you and baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Right there in the Great Commission, by the way, Jesus shows that there is a trinity. (laughs) Right there in the Great Commission. If anybody argues with you about the Trinity, there it is, right there in the Great Commission. Partner with God in a mission and purpose for your life. And then, fifthly, be willing to suffer. Uh Uh-oh, pastor, I don't know about that. You just, now you're getting into an area I don't want to have anything to do with. I don't like suffering. Suffering hurts. I don't like pain. I don't like doing without. I don't like this. I don't like that. Listen to here. Be willing to suffer for the sake of Christ in order to be a blessing to those who are crying out for him. What little bit of suffering we may have to entail in this society might just be shunning or ridicule, someone ridiculing you, someone calling you a Christian in some negative way. That's what they did in Antioch. Those are the Christians. But those Christians in Antioch took it as a, 
as a badge of honor. We are followers of Christ. We will pay the price. And they did. Many of them died on crosses just like Christ did. Are you willing to just be ridiculed and laughed at just for the sake of Christ? Be willing to suffer for the sake of Christ. If there's five words I could leave with you today before we have the Lord's Supper, it would be these five words. Taken right from Hebrews chapter 11, verse 25. He chose to be mistreated. Moses was a type of Christ because he chose to be mistreated. When we proclaim Christ as our Savior, as the risen Lord, the one who defeated death and sin, when we proclaim that from our hearts and mouths, then we too are choosing to be mistreated. Think about it. Father, the gauntlet has been laid down. How many in this room have chosen to truly be mistreated? How many in this room hear your voice? Father, speak to us today that we would hear it. Bless this time of remembering the sacrifice you gave upon the cross. In your holy name we pray. Amen. If our ushers, our, our Lord's Supper servers could come forward, please.
whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. So a man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and sick, and a number of you have fallen asleep. For if we judged ourselves, we would not come under such judgment. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are being disciplined so that we will not be condemned with the world. Jesus said, this is my body broken for you. As often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. The blood that must have run down from your head, Jesus, was, must have been horrific. I can't imagine the head wounds from those spikes that pierced your skull pierced your skin we cannot even fathom the pain that you took with the nails being driven into your wrists or hands and your feet how could we begin to understand the lashes that you took that stripped the skin off of your back and it was just flesh and yet you endured all that pain your body received what the punishment was that we should have received. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for the high cost of the penalty of sin that you fulfilled. In your holy name we pray. Amen.
Jesus said, if anyone is thirsty, let him come. If anyone is hungry, let him come. He also said, come unto me, all you who are weak, weary, heavy laden. I will give you rest. We struggle so often. And we lose so much rest just because we won't come to him. Jesus declared that this was a symbol, what he called the blood of the new covenant. That as often as you do this, you do this in remembrance of him declaring not only his death, but his impending return. Do this in remembrance of Jesus. For your sacrifice for the blood you shed. There is no other price that can be paid. There's no other work that can be done. There is no other achievement by which we can put into our own effort that gives us, that makes us worthy in the sight of God is only by your blood, O Jesus. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. We're going to stand and sing a verse of one, one verse of this last song, one verse after which I will share a benediction. be people at the door as you leave if God would lead you to give to the deacon's benevolence fund. I think they may have been taking some up while you were just singing. You can also give as you're leaving. It goes to help people who are in crisis. Finally, my brothers and my sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think, think about these things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. God bless you all. Have a great day.